Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I have an update on my vintage 1940s sweater project, and I have some more tips on how to prepare for finish at February. So let's get started. This first tidbit came to me, I think probably in my Twitter feed. It is a blog post on a website called fabricsstore.com, but it, the, the blog post is called Finery and Lace Embroidery in Europe. It's got some fantastic pictures of like Viking embroidery from like the 9th and 10th century and all kinds of examples of early embroidery in, from Europe and uh, a bit of history in that as well. Uh, I found it really interesting and I just love looking at really old textiles and just marveling at the fact that they've survived at all. So if you're interested in that, there's a link down in the show notes. So this next item came to me from my Twitter feed. Uh, it was an article in Teen Vogue magazine, and which I will link to down below, but I got interested in learning more about it. The story is talking about a famous oil painting by artist R. McGill McCall, which depicts Mary Pittersgill, the woman most known for designing the Star Spangled Banner in Baltimore, to celebrate United States victory against Great Britain during the War of 1812. So I didn't know anything about this uh, painting, but I did look it up. And for some reason, I assumed that the painting had been done in the 19th century, but it was really recently. It was like in the 70s. Maybe it was in, in honor of the bicentennial celebration or something. But it's in the painting, um, McCall included Pickersgill's daughter Carolyn or Caroline and one of her nieces who also helped design the flag that would go on to inspire Francis Scott Key to write the national anthem. And so here in the U.S. our national anthem is called the Star Spangled Banner and it's named after our flag which has stars and stripes on it. A missing from the painting however is Grace Wisher, the 13 year old black girl who is an indentured servant to Pickersgill and is often overlooked in the storytelling of the nation's most prominent visual emblem which has caused much debate throughout history. So I wanted to see the original painting because I had, didn't know anything about that painting. The story of this flag is that these officers came to Mary Pickersgill and asked her to create this flag that was 30 feet by 42 feet. So huge. So she and her uh, daughter and her nieces and Grace Wisher uh, were sewing all of the stripes uh, by hand. There's no sewing machines back then. They are estimating that there were a million hand stitches in this flag. So when it came time to assemble the entire thing together, the flag was bigger than the floor of their house. So they went down the street to this pub. And so there's another painting that's showing them on the floor of the pub, sewing it all together. And in that painting, you can see uh, Grace Wisher and both the, the nieces besides, uh, who are all working on the flag. And they're, they're on the floor sewing that thing together. So I found this story really interesting. So I'm gonna leave links to the Teen Vogue article that sent me on this journey. This next tidbit came to me from Topher, who is a member of my Ravelry group. He sends me tidbits every so often, which I really appreciate. It's a link to a website that shows the work of this uh, Scottish fiber artist named Jo Hamilton, who uh, makes her own, it's called Plarn. So it's plastic yarn that's made by recycling like plastic bags or whatever. Uh, and so she, all of the materials that she uses for her art are things that are being reused, recycled. She does, she's not using any new materials in order to create uh, her artwork. So if you would like to learn more about Jo Hamilton and see more of her art, you can find a link down in the show notes. 
I recently bought this book. It's called the Minerva Knitting Annual 1950. Now here in the US, there was a yarn company called the Minerva Yarn Company. It was owned by the James Lee and Sons Company. Uh, but this book was published in the UK. And the authors of this book are Jane Coster and Margaret Murray. Th they were sisters-in-law and they wrote a series of books uh, called Practical Knitting Illustrated. So this one was very popular and many, many printing came out, you know, it was re reprinted throughout the 1940s. Um, but they came out with seven other titles that had very similar names like Knitting Illustrated or Complete Family Knitting or Complete Home Knitting or Garments for All. And they all had knitting and the word illustrated in it. Some of these books, not all of them, but some of them had information in the back for using a gridded schematic for designing or modifying patterns. So this book was published in 1940. Uh, in the US, the Minerva Yarn Company had produced a book in 1936 that talked about their uh, new method called Knit to Fit. And it also used this gridded um, system. And actually the patterns in this book are all presented with this gridded schematic and with really minimal instructions, but things like how many stitches to cast on, what kind of ribbing, and then the little dots here indicate the increases so you can see how frequently you're increasing every inch, how many you bind off, you know, how, and then how often you're doing the, the decreases. So you have a lot of information in here. So this is the US Minerva Yarn Company's book on Knit to Fit that's using these gridded schematics. And then Practical Knitting Illustrated by Jane Coster and her sister-in-law, Margaret Murray, had a similar uh, presentation in the 1940s in the UK. So this book is written by the same women who wrote this book, and it has a very similar name to this book. So I just wanted to make sure everything's clear. What's really interesting, uh, and Minerva was like the goddess of craftsmanship. That's why the, the name Minerva is being used multiple times by different companies or in different contexts. Um, so this is a book that has a lot of the same types of things that they had in their, in their 1940s books, um, Coster and, and Murray. The, the difference is they do have some ads from yarn companies in here. The, the models in here are like British film stars. But what's really interesting to me is that at the back of the book, they have this section here called Five Reigns of Knitting, 1840 to 1950. And they're referring to the five British monarchs during this time period. Um, so the 1840s is really when you start to see um, knitting manuals being published. There's a few printed publications with knitting instructions prior to this, but this has really become sort of the, the time when knitting manuals and knitting patterns are really um, starting to um, appear. And so some of the, the knitting man books that they refer to are specifically listed and, and the year that they were published, and many of these are available on archive.org as digitized, cop, uh, digitized versions. There was one thing that I found in here that I thought was really interesting. It's a new method, sound familiar, for perfect fitting garments. And it says, during the early part of the Edwardian era, Needlecraft Practical Journal published, quote, a new method for making perfect fitting garments in the knitting, in knitting or crochet. So they don't say what year. So Needlecraft Practical Journal was published, I think it was seven times per year. And each issue focused on a specific type of needle of needlecraft. It could be embroidery or tatting, or it could be crochet, or it could be knitting. And so they would have each issue during the year would be focused on something different. 
And they don't say what year this occurred in. They're just saying the early Edwardian era. So, you know, 1902, 3, 4, something like that. But what they're talking about is that the popularity of hand-knitted garments continues to increase every month. Many workers, however, are unable to follow a long pattern with detailed instructions. The new method is to follow paper patterns. Here are the garments to be made by the new method. So my feeling is that it's probably a schematic based type of pattern, which is really how sewing patterns at the time were. They would give you a little drawing in a magazine and they would give you the dimensions and then and then you would have to scale that up for yourself. But it might be on a graded part pattern, I don't know. They don't tell the year. This is not a publication that's available on archive.org. I've looked. I've looked in all of the usual sources like Antique Pattern Library. There are some sellers on Etsy who have various issues of Needlecraft Practical Journal. Some of them are for knitted comforts, but none of them seem to show this particular illustration. So that I'm looking for this because I would love to see what their new method of paper pattern instructions were. And I, I just think it's interesting that it, it kept appearing and then it would go away in favor of written instructions and how infrequently schematics were even supplied in patterns back in this era, even when there's written instructions, like they just wouldn't show you what the sh total shape was. If they would just tell you it's going to fit a 36 inch bust or something like that. So if anybody knows of a source of Needlecraft Practical Journal, specifically one that contains this, I would really appreciate it. Like I said, I've been looking on Etsy and there are some from the early 1900s that are knitted comforts, but nothing that's showing these, this set of garments and uh, I can't find them in any source. So if anybody has some ideas, like you know that Needlecraft Practical Journal is on that particular website, um, please let me know because I am dying to find out more about what this new method is. So my current work in progress is a 1940s, a vintage 1940s sweater. It's part of my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. The overall goal of this project is to understand the evolution of the hand knit sweater and of patterns for the hand knit sweater. So I wanna see how, what the how the purpose of sweaters has changed, the construction methods, the tools and materials, uh, and also how patterns are presented to the knitter. So all of those things are something that I'm looking for. And I'm looking specifically to learn something new from each sweater. And so that could be just because it has an unusual construction element or because I need to modify it in a way that challenges me in some way. I need to modify it for fit or because there's a difference in the gauge in some way that's going to make this more challenging. So one of the things about vintage and antique sweater patterns up until about 1950 is that they only came in one size. So in the 1940s, you're looking at something that's a fine gauge and close fitting because these, at this period of time, they're very much a fashion item. And I'm doing this in collaboration with Billy from Show and Tell Knitting. We chose the pattern together and then we've been making our own decisions about how we are going to construct this and how we're going to knit this and what kinds of modifications we're going to make. Because again, it came in one size. And so last week uh, I showed you a little bit of the conversation Billy, most recent conversation Billy and I had uh, about the decisions that we made, like how we approach the modifications. And she on her channel had the larger conversation. I just was showing a little bit of it. I started with the sleeve and I started with the sleeve because it was very, it's completely straight up to the armhole and then you get the shaping. And I have some issues sometimes with fingering weight yarns and gauge, particularly when I'm knitting at the recommended gauge, which is a sweater gauge. Usually when I'm working with fingering weight yarn, I'm working at a firmer gauge than is recommended on the ball band because I'm knitting socks. And so I am not always completely confident of what needle size I'm going to need to get a specific gauge. So I had done some swatching 
but I thought the sleeve was an ideal place to confirm. Basically use my sleeve as a huge swatch because it just goes straight up. And I knew that I would be close enough that if I was off a little bit, it wouldn't really affect the size of the sleeve too much. And so my goal was I was gonna knit the first three triangles, wash and block it, confirm my gauge, and then continue from there. And what I discovered was I was actually getting seven and a half stitches per inch, not the seven stitches per inch I thought I was getting um, at the start, which meant I had time to do a couple of increases. This is all rolled up because the upper part hasn't been blocked, but it, it gave me uh, a little time uh, right in here to add a few more increases in order to get the, the width I needed for the upper arm before I started the sleeve cap shaping. So this was a perfect way to confirm gauge and not have to rip everything out. I have moved on to the body. Now this pattern, the original pattern calls for working the back and the front exactly the same. And there is shoulder shaping, and but the neck is maybe six and a half inches, the opening is six and a half inches wide and on each, the front and the back, and then there's just a straight across neck. And then there's a couple of snaps in the shoulder to create a larger opening in order to get over the head. I really don't want that straight across uh, business in the neck. I, I don't think I will, I know I won't like that. So I have some plans to do some, a different sort of neck in the front. I'm gonna be changing the shoulders and the neck a little bit. But the back is going to be very close to the original pattern, just with some different stitch counts to accommodate my different measurements. I'm about two triangles, and you'll see that the triangles go in a different direction for the sleeve. They point up, but for the body, they point down. When I sat down and did the schematic for the sweater, I found fascinating was how the waist shaping was done. And so this is, this is my, uh, one of my key learning things, the things I'm most excited about with the sweater is how the waist shaping is done because it was something I'd seen and heard of before and experimented with but hadn't done on an actual sweater. So I'm in the section right now where I've, I've done the decreases and they're done in four places on each half of the sweater, so the front and the back. So you have a decrease at the beginning and end of the row, but you also have them where I have these markers right here. There's a vertical line right here where there's decreases done there on, on either side of the center panel. And what that does is it creates like a waist dart there. So you're, you're creating shaping all the way around, not just at the sides. So this is really uh, interesting to me. Now I'd seen this, type of thing done before with waist shaping and with bust darts as vertical bust darts. I typically don't need to use bust darts in my sweaters. Just I have broad enough shoulders that the sweaters are big enough for my bust and not super busty anyway. So I don't tend to need any sort of bust dart shaping. But it was interesting to me to see how this was concentrated at the waist and then there's additional increases uh, above the waist shaping, but only on the sides. So this is a thing that's really interesting to me to see this evolution of how the bust is accommodated in sweaters in the first half of the 20th century. Because these days people might use short row shaping to add length to, for the bust, but you could also use these vertical darts in order to add circumference. So some people use both of those if they're knitting something that's more closely fitting and they want to add uh, shaping. And what they tended to do back then as the sweaters were knit at finer gauges and they were more closely hugging the body is that they would just make the front an, an inch wider and an inch longer than the back. And so they weren't using short rows to do that. They just use full rows because they would have seams up the side and then the idea was you would ease in that extra inch of the front into the seam uh, with the back so you know if you had an extra 10 rows in the front you know you might work you might seam every 20 rows for the back you might seam 21 to the front something like that where you just gradually um, ease that in there. And then the additional length would also accommodate a bust coming out. So that, that's really interesting to see that. And it's interesting for me to see 
how the waist shaping is done in this particular one and then also additional accommodation for um, the bust above the waist as well. So I'm gonna go to the overhead and just show you a little more closely what this looks like. These markers are right here are to mark where the waist shaping goes that is inside. So these vertical lines are lining up there. I think they're about eight inches apart, which is typical for the bust points, um, lining them up. Uh, and so you have this vertical line right here and the decreases are worked always right against that same place. So the two stitches that come right after um, the marker are worked together. And uh, over here would be the, the two stitches uh, before the marker are worked together. And so they're always worked in the same place there. And then on the sides, I'm working them, I think uh, just one stitch in. So I leave the salvage stitch completely in stockinette so that when I go to seam it later, I'll have a nice clean column of stockinette that I can seam from uh, one edge to the other. I do that if I'm gonna be picking up stitches as well. I, I don't typically like to put the increases or decreases in that edge stitch. You'll see I have one other marker here. Let me zoom in and you can see what's going on there. I marked it because, and it's pulled a little bit because the marker has been in there. Uh, that's an extra stitch. When I am working on a right side row, well, any row, I'm always working an additional stitch in the triangle color as I'm going out. and. I, when I'm making mistakes in this intarsia pattern, I make them on the wrong side of the row typically. And then I catch them later. So uh, I knit an extra stitch too far uh, on here. So I just wanted to mark it so that I could correct it later. Uh, the way I correct it is with a uh, duplicate stitch. I made a mistake in this. Uh, one of these triangles, where is it? Right here. If you if you look underneath here, you can see that there is a purple stitch. I had accidentally on a purl row knit an extra purple stitch. And so I used a duplicate stitch to cover it up. I haven't woven in the ends yet. Um, and that just will cover up that mistake. If you know it's there and you pull this apart, you, you can see that that purple is under there. But in the larger scheme of things, it's not really noticeable. So I'll be doing a video on duplicate stitch as both a method for correcting as well as a method for uh, just adding uh, little bits of color. That will be a video that I'll be doing sometime in the next few weeks. This is how I drew the waist shaping uh, when I was drawing the schematic of the original pattern. So this is, this is dimensions of the original pattern using their gauge and stitch count. I could figure out how wide everything was at particular points and then like how long the shaping was going on and then so how far in that would make something go. So the decreases were worked at the edge a certain number of times, which brought the edge in a certain amount. But then there were these decreases right here next to this vertical line. And so it was always the stitches to the right of this vertical line that were being eliminated. And so that's why I created this triangle here. And then as I was creating increases, I was adding that column of stitches back in. So it created this sort of a uh, little shaped item and that gives me an idea of what the the sweater is actually going to look like it, and you can see that it was quite narrow at the hips and then it got uh, significantly bigger up at the bust so this is what i started with and i could see what the stitch counts were and i could figure out what rate the decreases were working at then i could use the software that i use for charting all of my patterns uh, which is stitch mastery i, I could have done this in stitch mastery but I just find it easier to do this part of it, to read through the pattern and draw things in and then figure it out and do calculations by hand. It, that part is just easier for me. And then I can take this initial silhouette and say, well, if this is 30 inches around at the high hip, I actually want you know, 34 inches around the high hip. Uh, and if this is uh, 34 inches around the bust, I really want 36 inches. And so I, I can go through and figure that out at different points in order to change the silhouette. And I do the changes 
in Stitch Mastery. And then it's that chart that I work from when I'm actually knitting the sweater. Last week, I introduced you to Finish Up February. Many of you are familiar with it. I've been doing this on my channel since I started Casual Friday podcast in 2018. The purpose of Finish Up February is to reduce your UFO pile. And so last week, I talked you through how to pull out all of your UFOs and sort them into one of three piles, the yay pile, the nay pile, and the pile of ambiguity. So last week, we dealt with the nay pile, the pile which you are done knitting that even if there are still stitches on the needle, you are finished. And how, and then what you can do with those projects without having to knit anything more on them, but immediately reduce the number of things in your UFO pile. So this week, I wanna take the first step in addressing the yay pile. This is the pile that you are excited about. These are the things that you want to finish. So we're gonna talk about going through that pile. Now, some of you may not have a very large pile of UFOs. Some of you may have had a really large pile a few years ago and have gradually learned how to uh, reduce that pile on, on a consistent basis, whether it's regularly throughout the year or if it's through the help of Finish Up February. Um, for those of you who are new to this whole idea, if you've been knitting for years or decades, like I had been when I first pulled out all of my UFOs, you may have a lot of them. And I don't mean you have eight or nine of them. I mean, you might have dozens of them or even as many as a hundred or more UFOs. So that was what the getting, sorting the, the initial sort out where you got rid of the ones that you absolutely do not want to work on really helps to reduce that feeling of being overwhelmed. So this is the stage where you go through the yay pile and if you have a lot of UFOs, you, you might want to sort them into piles by project category. That's what I did uh, my first year of going through all of my UFOs. Uh, I, I had a pile of unfinished sock projects, sweaters, scarves, mittens, uh, I don't know, oh, a couple of blankets. And then I had uh, a miscellaneous pile, which was there was one item of each of a couple of, I think I had one hat and one dishcloth. And that was just a miscellaneous pile. So you have these different categories. So what I did, what works for me, if you've been watching me for a while, you know that I love spreadsheets. So you could use a legal pad and a, a pencil. You could do whatever works for you. What helped me was to go through each of those categories, like all of my sock projects, and name them, give them a name that I would recognize, like the Red Bavarian sock or the Argyle socks. Something where when I looked at that name, I would know what sock project that was. And then I wrote down what needed to be done on that project. So this was really helpful to me for the categories where I had a lot of projects. After I had gotten rid of the, the projects I didn't want anything more to do with, I was still left with 37 to 38 projects and fully half of them were unfinished sock projects. So some of you may say, oh, I have second sock syndrome too. I don't have second sock syndrome. <laughs> the reason I have so, or had so many unfinished sock projects is because I knit so many socks. That was like a 10 year pile of sock UFOs that I had just been unaware of. So I would knit four or five pairs of socks just fine. And then I'd run into a problem of some sort with a particular sock and I'd put that one to the side and I would forget about it. So that is why I had so many sock projects. I had quite a few more sweater projects than I anticipated as well. And that is because the two types of projects I knit the most are socks and sweaters. So if you see that and you think, oh my God, I didn't, I have no idea that I never finish a whatever type of project, that may not be the case. It could be that you just knit a lot of that kind of project and therefore the majority of your UFOs are that type of project. So I went through and I looked at, well, what needs to be done on each of these? And I ranked them in the really large categories like my sock category, I didn't rank all 17 or 18 of sock projects. I ranked the top 10. The top five were ones that were going to need the least amount of time in order to end up with a completed pair. 
maybe it was an argyle sock where I had to weave in quite a few yard tails because of the different colors and then I needed to do some seaming because it was an Antarsha project. Uh, or I needed to reinforce the heels of a pair of socks that were completed. The top five were the ones that really had the least amount of work. And then the next five were, were sock projects where I had one completed sock, so I needed to knit an entirely full second sock in order to have the pair. And so I just picked my five favorite out of all of those. And I didn't even think about the bottom half of that category. So I went through this process for each of those categories. And in some cases, I only had a couple of things in that category, so it was pretty easy. But the important thing was to figure out what needed to be done in each of the, for each of those projects, and then figure out how to rank those within that category in terms of the amount of time that it would need uh, in order to complete them. And then what are my favorites? What are the ones I'm most excited about working on that actually have knitting? Because sometimes the things get put to the side because the knitting is done and it's the finishing work that uh, needs to still be done. So, so far you've categorized them, you've evaluated them for what needs to be done, and then you've ranked them. So now before you can even work on anything, you're gonna have to store them away again, which means they're gonna be out of sight. So for me, I'm very much an out of sight, out of mind person, and which is what got me into trouble with having so many UFOs and not being aware of that. So what worked for me, everybody's got a different storage system that, that works for them. I have these IKEA storage systems in my office. And so I have quite a few of these kind of sort of semi-clear bins. And what I did was instead of just having things randomly stuffed into different bins, I cleared out a few of them and I had one that was just all of my sock projects because there were so many of them. And then I had another one that had like the mittens and the scarves. So I had categories and then I put a post-it note on the outside of that bin so that I would always know where to go look for that type of project when it was time to work on it. So this was important for me to have those visual reminders without necessarily having everything on display at one time, just knowing where to easily find them. The spreadsheet that I had was a way for me to get the kind of the big picture of what there actually was and what was left to do. And it would help me plan what are the next couple of things I'm going to work on and be able to kind of see what I had in different categories and figure out what my, my game plan was going to be um, for the short term. So once we have categorized them, evaluated them, ranked them, and then stored them, as we work on the projects, for me, I like, again, to have that visual reminder of what it is that I've accomplished because it really motivates me. I found this, my old spreadsheet from 2016, and I found this little checklist, this visual checklist that I had taped to my wall of my office. And I, when I started, I thought I had 37. I think I eventually found one more sock project. So I really had 38. I just had this numbered thing on my wall. You could figure out what would work for you. And when I finished something, I would write it in that little square with the date that I wrote it on. I don't know why the date was important, but somehow it, it, it made sense to me. And then I would put an X through that box. So I wasn't writing all of the projects in that box anticipating, well, this is what I'm gonna work on next because I like to leave myself flexible. But I really liked through the year seeing those X's just fill up the sheet. So whatever your re reward system is, if you need a visual reward system or some other kind of reward system, I would encourage you to do that because it can be really motivating and it, it can make you so happy just to be able, to, not just to complete something, but I gave my, especially if you're, if you're doing something that maybe isn't as fun as the knitting was, like if you had to, to weave in a lot of ends or something like that, some kind of reward system that would work for you. So once you have kind of figured out overall what it is that your projects need in order to be completed, I would really encourage you to start with the projects that need the least amount of time in order to be considered completed because it feels so good to be able to cross those off of your UFO list. And as you work through those really quick 
finishes, you're going to get into those larger projects that are going to take more time and which are at risk of once again becoming a UFO. So next week, I'm going to talk about managing those larger projects that you might have that uh, you just know you're not going to be able to just sit and knit through uh, all the way until they're finished. Uh, so we're, we'll talk about that next week. Well, one thing I want to mention that Finish It February can also be used for, and a lot of times these are also very quick things, is I often take the opportunity to fix things that maybe have frayed edges or need buttons sewn on again, or that uh, I need to, I don't like the neck on that sweater, so maybe I'll re-knit it, or maybe I've got a worn spot in an elbow and I want to reinforce that so, so it doesn't turn into a bigger hole. Uh, I did that with a, a sweater, I was more like a sweater coat that's made from bulky weight yarn, very big, and I almost wear it like a, a daytime bathrobe in the winter. <laughs> Uh, and, and I love that sweater, but I always wished that it, there was a belt because it, the fronts overlapped if you held it closed, but as soon as you put your arms down, it would fly open. A shawl pin did not work for me. It's, it's not something that was a good solution for me. It, it can be for other people. I just kept wishing that I had a belt. And so when I moved into this office just about a year ago and I was moving all my yarn over and I was moving all these storage containers over, I came across uh, some leftovers of that original yarn and I realized there was enough to, to fix the frayed cuffs and the worn out elbow, but there was also enough for me to knit belt loops and a belt. And so I, I fixed the sweater, but I also enhanced it and I gave it a feature that I'd always wished that I had, um, but had never gotten around to use it. So that's something I also use Finish It February for is enhancements or repairs to existing um, items of knitwear. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you loved it, please consider subscribing. And if you have any comments or suggestions about videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those comments down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.